High in the hills above Florence stands La Pietra. It's a villa that dates back to the 15th century and that great time of the Italian Renaissance when painting, sculpture and architecture flourished in Tuscany. The villa was in its time home to powerful Florentine bankers and nobles. Then early this century it was bought by an Englishman, Arthur Acton, and it was there in July 1904 that Harold Acton was born and it is there that he lived till his death last weekend at the age of 89. Harold Acton was a man who announced right at the start of his long journey through our turbulent century that he intended to identify himself with creative spirits wherever they might be. We citizens of the world are neither famous nor spectacular, but there is a slow fire burning within us and it is time for our latent energies to swell forth anew. It is time for us to reassert ourselves. And it is our duty to remind our fellow creatures of what they are fast forgetting, that true culture is universal. Over 2,000 years ago, Confucius talked of Tian Xia Wei Kung, the universe for everybody. Such an aspiration will only be realized by North, South, East and West, speaking mind to mind and body to body, a mutual exchange of ideas between the nations, ideas without national boundaries. Yet, as I look around me, I can see that I am quite a rare person. Politicians everywhere, booming and thumping. All the more reason for me to raise my gentle voice. The most convenient way to avoid being shouted down is to write my memoirs. Write them he did, and his memoirs of Anisvit went through several editions and are still in print. In them, Harold Acton plunges us into his childhood in Italy, his school days at Eton, that most privileged of schools, and his student days at Oxford, when he nailed his colours firmly to the mast of culture, poetry, and a passion for the beautiful, which earned him the name of Aesthete, and, it said, inspired the young Evelyn War to capture him in the character of Ambrose Silk in his novel Put Out More Flags. Acton dreamed of becoming a novelist himself, but his destiny was to lie elsewhere. It took him to China in the 1930s when he discovered the joy of teaching, communicating his love of literature to the younger generation of Chinese. Then, back to Italy, to chart some of that country's colourful history in a series of racy accounts of the Spanish Bourbon dynasty, which ruled Naples for centuries. But perhaps Harold Acton will be best remembered for his generosity of spirit, his supreme role as host to friends, writers, scholars and sometimes royalty. But the ordinary tourist was never forgotten. You only had to ring up in order to visit the gardens. And it's those gardens which sound a haunting refrain in Acton's autobiography. That garden which awakened his senses in the summers of his youth. The morning began in a haze of heat. This shimmering haze was like an hallucination over the valley. It floated above reality, and all day long the senses were sharpened rather than dulled by it, until the bats came squeaking into the dusk like the shriveled souls of witches who had lost their broomsticks. At night, when the statues slowly exhaled all the heat waves they had absorbed, there was a multiple illumination of the atmosphere. You could see the statues breathing. The stars seemed incredibly near, and below, the lights of the city spread as from a starfish in long tentacular rays glowing serpentine along the river and upward through the mists. Nearer were the fireflies, lighting up stretches of the terrace, half waking it from its dark, flower-drugged dream, then letting it sleep on. And it was a hot summer's day when I visited Sir Harold two years ago, and we gazed out over the cooling green before us. I was born here, and naturally I saw the garden grow. And my father was a great gardener. He collected the statues stoned by famous sculptors. At that time, they were not sufficiently appreciated. I think they're more so today. Fortunately, there are more students of garden architecture now than there used to be when I was young. What are really the enchanting qualities of this garden? What is it that makes it so attractive? Well, it is an architectural garden, above all. Unlike gardens in England, which depend entirely on flowers, this depends on architecture, on the layout. That's the difference. Italian classical gardens 
are architectural chiefly, and this is extremely so. I know in your autobiography, The Memoirs of an East Seat, you describe how wonderful it was as a boy to roam in this garden, to discover extra parts of it, to grow to love it very much. Yes, for the older I grow, the more I discover, the more I appreciate. I think when one's extremely young, one doesn't appreciate all the works of art. Florence, we are surrounded by works of art, and I think it influenced my whole outlook and been lucky in life. Now that I'm getting old, I um, realize how lucky I was. You are obviously as much Italian as, as English. What is your Italian identity? Where you are born and the first language that you spoke naturally influences one. And I was I've been tremendously influenced by my Italian surroundings and the language spoken around me and the poetry of the people, which is general. Uh, the Italians are the most poetical people. They naturally love their own poets, which I'm sorry to say is not so in England. I don't think that we do appreciate our poets to the extent that the Italians appreciate theirs. You are really the living embodiment of this great love affair between Florence and the British, and indeed in the 19th century, some of our leading poets, Robert Browning, lived here. There was an enormous British community here. Can you tell us something about that Anglo-Florentine relationship? Florence has always been, since the 19th century, I should say, very English in spirit. Former English members of Parliament retired here, where it was a place where everybody chose to retire. There was a large British community here when I was young, but it has dwindled, alas, in the last 20 years. Fewer and fewer English writers come here to be inspired as Browning and others were in the past. But uh, those who do come are very enthusiastic and write about it. Your great love early on was poetry, and as a schoolboy you wrote a lot of poetry. Uh, as, as an undergraduate you wrote poetry, you ran literary magazines, and in fact your, your earliest ambition really was to be a writer, wasn't it? Yes, I thought of myself, as many people do, as poets, and I started very young to write, to babble in verse, and the result was that I was published when I was extremely young, in various magazines, and when I was at Oxford, I started various things like Oxford Poetry I edited. And there was a great, I think, a very fine poet, uh, now perhaps forgotten, uh, Peter Quinnell, with whom I edited Oxford Poetry. I asked to edit it with me, who was much more punctilious than I was. A very fine poet. <clears throat> I think he's, he, he, he should come back now, you did actually settle down and write a novel, Humdrum, but yeah. in the process you rather discovered that perhaps writing wasn't your true vocation. Fiction is not my vocation. I wish I had that vocation because everybody reads fiction nowadays. My feeble attempts to write novels I regret because I don't consider that they're <laughs> worth considering. I, when I look at these things, I blush if I'm capable of blushing. But it was interesting, because in a sense, the fact that you weren't going to be a writer of fiction meant that you had to find yourself an alternative destiny, and a great moment came for you, didn't it, when you went off and lived in China from 1932 for seven years. You yes. actually went and lived in Peking. Happiest years of my life. What was it that drew you to China so powerfully? Well, well I always had a passion for Chinese art, and I love Chinese music even, which is an unusual in Europe. I l used to listen to Meilan Fang again and again, and I was lucky enough to meet him, who was one of the greatest female impersonators in the world, and a memorably good actor, or actress, how can we say, because he was always on the stage in the dress of a woman but he really was a supreme actor and with a beautiful voice 
and his voice and singing Chinese, which is, has to be sung on the stage, was superb. To continue a bit more with your experiences in China, I believe to a certain extent, obviously you're brought up as a Catholic yourself, but that you found Buddhism very appealing, sympathetic. What, what was it that drew you there? Well, I think that all religions have a great deal in common, and I don't think that sufficiently appreciated that Buddhism has got most of its principles are the same as those of Christianity. Their rights are different from ours, but uh, there's a very, very close proximity to all religions, I think, and they're particularly between Catholicism and Buddhism. It was not that the monasteries and temples, so tenderly built in each cool wooded recess of the western hills, contained great works of art. It was not that monks were particularly saintly, although their freedom from the fruitless cares and empty hopes of ordinary life was perceptible in their gentle courtesy. But these rambling buildings, courtyards, stone terraces and fish ponds, each compact as a separate village, produced a total effect more overpowering than many a finer, more ambitious structure. They exhaled the peace that passeth all understanding. I had seldom, if ever, found such peace in Christian places of worship. The crucifix alone recalls scenes of agony, and death and tears are always present. But here the smiling Buddhas and Lohans tranquilized the mind, and their smiles pervaded each temple. Impatience, the most marked characteristic of all modern modes of thought and the curse of all our lives, was banished by the light of Buddha's smile. It was quite a centre of Peking of religion, of Buddhism. And also, of course, there was a Catholic, a Roman Catholic university in Peking, which I taught for a short time, which was flourishing. Some of the loveliest descriptions in your autobiography, The Memoir of an East Theatre, are when you first start teaching and you have this enormous enthusiasm for helping your students to love English literature. You've got your students writing essays, literary, well, really literary compositions, and yes. you discovered a great feeling for a great poetic sensibility, really. Oh, I think they're the most poetical people in the world. Even now, I'm afraid I'm out of touch living in Florence, and so I'm rather out of touch with my Chinese friends at the moment, but all those that I know are still extremely poetically minded, literary, and very advanced intellectually. I have a great admiration for the Chinese people in general, and my dearest friends have always been Chinese, I may say. Now, of course, you had to leave China when the Second World War er erupted, and after serving in the war, you came back to Florence. And then there's really a completely new chapter in your life, and you decide to start writing a lot about Italian history, and in particular the history of the royal family that reigned in the south of Italy, in Naples and Sicily yes. for centuries, the Bourbons. Yes. And so you went to Naples and started writing about the history. Why did you decide to do that? I suppose that is a family thing, because one of my ancestors was a prime minister of Naples. And a great many of my Acton cousins are still Neapolitan and live there and gave me every sort of help when I went down to write about the Bourbons. I am one of the rare people who really admires them and thinks that they were admirable as rulers of a very difficult kingdom. They were extremely uh, good politicians to begin with, and they had warm hearts, and though they were foreign origin, they were able to adapt themselves perfectly to the Neapolitan mentality. Naples was obviously at one point a very, very beautiful city. It's a far less beautiful city now, but what was the appeal of Naples at its height? Oh, Naples produced the most beautiful architecture and great works of art in all directions, whether it's sculpture or painting. Now a little forgotten by most, Solimena and other great 
painters were extremely prolific and we find their works all over the city which is still a magnificent center of the arts. To describe Naples in spring before it had been affected by either world war is like trying to paint a diamond. Who can depict that crystallized flash of light of which a single facet produces a rainbow of a thousand other facets? Not only the miraculous blue of the sea between Vesuvius and Capri, Posilipo and Ischia, not only the miraculous liquefaction of San Gennaro's blood, but things not miraculous at all. The flavour of pizza, with its pungent blend of anchovy, tomato, melted cheese and peppers. Such sea fruit as vongole, served with macaroni of tougher texture than elsewhere, and the brilliant, wicked-looking sea urchins. So many flavours and gesticulations in nature as in art. And the music all along the bay, in the restaurants, by the tame waves and among the fishing nets. A throbbing of mandolins and sobbing of high-pitched tenors. A music of ardent, unsatisfied longing will always make Naples a voluptuous carnival to the full-blooded writer. You also seem to be very drawn to the Neapolitan character, the Neapolitan mentality. What, what are they like as people? They are extremely brilliant. Naturally, they have quicker responses and appreciation than perhaps other Italians. Being a Florentine by birth, I should say Florentines were. But my real belief is that the Neapolitans are about the most brilliant Italians, the quickest mental responses to whatever happens in the world, and very fine writers they produce for the stage. Eduardo de Filippo is, to me, one of the great Italian dramatists. There's one side of uh, the Neapolitan way of seeing the world which uh, you seem to be particularly intrigued by, which is this fear of the evil eye, and in particular, a fear of people who, for some reason, have the power of putting the evil eye on other people. Yeah. And in fact, you've written a novel about it called Prince well, Isidore. Joke, yes. Why were you so fascinated by this well, business of the... Uh, because I'd known several people who had the reputation of being yet datori, that's say possessors of the evil eye, and... I don't really fundamentally believe in it, but it seemed to me a very picturesque and amusing subject to treat. And so I was able to write a lively, I hope, novel about a man who had the evil eye. I knew several people who had that reputation, and I must say I made the sign against the evil eye in my pocket when he came to see me. I was very nervous, because living in Naples, one is actually influenced by the atmosphere and the general beliefs of the people. And while I was there, I was rather nervous of some visitors who had the reputation of being yetatori. One was very eminent. Whenever he went, there was a calamity, except in my case. But I always kept a few little amulets in my pocket against the evil. I have some in my pocket. Chimaruta. Right from the beginning, you did have this tremendous sense of history. You also saw unfolding through the decades British literature this century, and indeed you knew many of, of, of the writers of this century, T.S. Eliot, Somerset Maugham, and a close contemporary of yours, Evelyn Waugh. What are your vividest memories of... of these many writers that you knew? What stands out in your mind? Well, I think that uh, England produces some of the best writers in the world. And I was lucky to have known some of those who I think are universally read. Somerset Mom used to come and live here in Florence. I used to see him frequently. And in spite of a very shy manner and a terrible stutter, he was able to communicate his writings of the whole world. I think he's still widely read as one of the most brilliant story writers. And uh, compared with Maupassant, I think that he stands good comparison, that we can fairly say that he's equal, if not better, than Maupassant. Evelyn Waugh, 
whom I knew intimately, was a natural good writer, full of pep and spirit and originality. He deserves to be called a classic, that his uh, novels, beautifully written as they are, and witty, lively, all the virtues that we appreciate in British fiction are eminently at their best with Evelyn War. An almost inseparable boon companion at Oxford was a little fawn called Evelyn War. I still see him as a prancing fawn, thinly disguised by conventional apparel. His wide-apart eyes, always ready to be startled under raised eyebrows, the curved, sensual lips, the hyacinthine locks of hair I had seen in marble and bronze at Naples, in the Vatican Museum and on fountainheads all over Italy. The gentleness of his manner could not deceive me. Though his horns had been removed, he was capable of butting in other ways. So demure and yet so wild. You've told some very amusing anecdotes about travelling with Evelyn War in, in Italy and in other countries, and there, in a sense, you, you had to be a bit of a diplomat. One had to be because he was so forthright, so British to the core, that he objected to anything that he was strange to him. And he easily found fault with things travelling in Italy, which the average person, the average Englishman, would have noted too, but uh, he had noted it even more than others. And he was e easily offended by a man on a train asking for his ticket. He took offence at anything that, he, that happened to him here. He was always on the edge. He was highly, uh, I suppose many writers are that way, good writers at any rate, responsive and reactive to what happens, you see, in daily life. And he was ultra-responsive and uh, reacted rapidly. You actually appear in some of his novels, don't you? Aren't you uh, partly the inspiration for some of his characters? I doubt it, though I think all writers are influenced by people they meet and friends, and perhaps there are little elements in some of his characters that he borrowed from me, but I very much doubt it, really. I don't feel that way at all. People think that I am one of his characters. I forget which, actually, but uh, I don't believe it. I think all novelists have to pick and choose from their friends and the people they meet to create characters. One of the poets that you had a very particular and at that stage unusual appreciation for was T.S. Eliot. You saw really the great power of his poetry before a lot of other people. I was and am a great admirer of T.S. Eliot, and I think The Wasteland is one of the great poems of our century. And uh, I was, only knew him slightly with Edith Sitwell and, and other mutual friends. And I, have, I still think he's one of the great outstanding poets and certainly critics of this century. His criticism has influenced nearly all other critics of value. Oh, I have a great admiration still for T.S. Eliot. I think The Wasteland is a, is a poem that will endure. You were also a very close friend with the Sitwells, with Edith Sitwell, a poetess, and her brothers Osbert and Sir Cheverell. And many people considered them very eccentric, very, well, very aristocratic, eccentric, but you always appreciated their talents very much, didn't you? Yes, I'm a great admirer of the Sitwells and think they will endure. At the moment, they seem to be rather under the weather, but Osbert was a brilliant satirist. Sashi Sir Cheverell, as I think, was a very fluent and eloquent poet. Edith, I think, was unique in her day. Edith? Very tall, slim, graceful, glided in, dressed in emerald brocade. A rare jewel. A hieratic figure in Limoges enamel, I thought, clamped in some tin biscuit box. But rarer, more hieratic against this background. 
The pale oval face with its almond eyes and long thin nose have often been carved in ivory by true believers. Her entire figure possessed a distinction seldom to be seen outside the glass cases of certain museums. Physically, she was an extraordinary survival from the age of chivalry. You write with great affection, great love for people like the Sitwells, for many of your other friends, and it strikes me really that friendship was one of your great gifts, that you yourself were also a very good friend. Oh, fortunately, fortunately, they were all friends. I was lucky in my life to have met people who are sympathetic to me and who were creative. Now, living in Florence here, yeah, of course, we are the center of creativity. And uh, the Italians who have been here since the earliest years have all been poets or writers or painters of a sort. It's a center of the arts, still is, I think. Though I look about me and I don't see any outstanding figure like Gabriele D'Annunzio, nobody of that altitude, but still, we have got a great number of brilliant writers here. And we open the Nazione, the daily paper, which I do every day, and it's strikingly brilliant in its essays and, and, and articles that you read. Remarkable, really. Well, you have lived right through this century, which is a century with terrible cataclysms in it, two world wars. And then more recently, we've seen another great turn of the wheel of history with communism really drawing to its close in, in, in Eastern Europe. In Western Europe, with the nations of Western Europe coming closer together, do you see this really as a time of optimism, a time of opportunities? I think one has to be an optimist. To be a pessimist is a confession of failure, I think, that one has to look forward to the creative instincts and the good qualities of Europeans. And I think the forces of order, common sense, imagination and poetry will win in the end. They must. They always have in the past. When you look back through history, it's always been particularly the history of England, always the forces of sense, common sense, have won. I cannot see the villa and garden again with the innocent eyes of my youth. But thoughts and emotions long dormant come drifting back, as when the terraces are lit up by fireflies in June, the midsummer shrillness of the cicadas, the high-pitched voices of peasants singing in the fields below, the air so deceptively crystalline that beyond the shimmering olives you feel you could stretch out your hand and touch the cathedral in Florence down below. Of all panoramas, it is this of the towers and cupolas in the valley framed between vineyards and the never-distant hills which give me that little stab now and then, that overpowering sense that this is Italy. To its potent harmony, I feel I owed the vein of poetry in my nature, which has never been adequately expressed. <laughs> 